I'm so happy to be with you today. Uh, this is, well, this is quite literally my first FaceTime Live, and I'm really happy to be here amongst all of you. Um, I'm really happy that, uh, and, and honored, that the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy was able to put this together uh, for all of us to be able to join during these rather challenging times. As an adventurer, as an explorer, being grounded and being uh, relegated to my home uh, right here in my office uh, is a bit of a challenge because I'm a very curious person and one that has uh, what we call wanderlust, which I'm sure all of you have as well. So let's go on a virtual adventure while we can. And with that, uh, I want to thank also my team at the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center. If you want to learn more about that, it's uh, Fabian, F-A-B-I-E-N, Cousteau, C-O-U-S-T-E-A-U, -E uh, O-L-C, Dot org if you want to learn more about what they do and of course check out the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy who has this wonderful platform. Now uh, before I go on too far uh, I want to uh, explain why I'm here. As some of you may know uh, I'm a third generation ocean explorer, uh, conservationist, and uh, aquanaut. And uh, an aquanaut, for uh, those who may be curious, is someone who uh, decides to live and work underwater from an underwater habitat. A little bit like uh, an astronaut living from the International Space Station. Now, uh, I guess to give you a, a bit of background, uh, as you might know from my last name, uh, we are a family of ocean explorers. My grandfather, Jacques-Yves Cousteau, uh, was a pioneer in ocean exploration, uh, was uh, a person that was ever curious. Uh, he inspired hundreds of millions of people around the world for over five decades of his ocean exploration. Uh, he and my grandmother, Simone, uh, were the uh, leaders in uh, a group of intrepid uh, pioneers. Uh, 50 or more of them uh, who were living on a boat called Calypso for many, many years and went around the world in different places way before the internet, way before cell phones and all that. I know it's hard to imagine. Uh, but they uh, had brought to us, not only us, the world, but us as uh, the family, uh, a sense of wonder, a sense of learning, a sense of connecting with that strange alien world under that blue veneer. And it gave us um, a real uh, curiosity for the connection between human beings and what is in our water, our water body, the 99% the of our world's living space. And we know so little about it because despite the fact of all modern day ocean exploration for the last 100 years, let's say, we've explored less than 5% of our ocean world to date. I mean, that's mind blowing. So there's so much left out there for you burgeoning explorers to go out and explore yourselves. Now, I, uh, I grew up in a very interesting and odd world. Uh, I grew up in a French family. Uh, you know, uh, you, you, you don't hear it from my voice, but uh, I could always put on a French accent for you. Let's go diving into the briny deep. Uh, I was born um, French. Uh, I grew up uh, in a French household, but I grew up uh, and I moved 31 times in my life between France and the United States. And I, I am a happy permanent resident of the United States. And as such, uh, I grew up uh, bilingual. Uh, and that to me gave me uh, an appreciation for so many different cultures and so many different aspects of our world at large that uh, we still have yet to explore. I've been diving since the ripe old age of four years old. I don't recommend that to anybody out there. Uh, and uh, I would say that if you are interested in diving, uh, you can start diving from 11 years old and you get scuba certified as a uh, full recreational scuba diver at 12 years old. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I have a few cards here 
myself of various different uh, dive certificates. Um, one of them, and the most important actually, is the insurance card uh, from Divers Alert Network. So for any of you who want to go diving out there, you'll be part of a small group of 3 million people around the world who have learned to scuba dive and are venturing off into that amazing aquatic world to break free of the earthly bonds to fly underwater in any direction. It's a pretty amazing thing. And it allows us to go and explore the rest of that 95% that we have yet to explore. When I was growing up, um, most of my schooling uh, was, of course, traditional like many of you, although right now we are relegated to our homes to learn more about math, science, technology, engineering, history, and all that. But I also dreamt about adventure, and I got the chance to join my family uh, from the ripe old age of seven and on regular expeditions since I was 12. And my schooling, although it was in various uh, schools in high school and universities, such as Boston University, where I learned, uh, of all things, environmental economics. Uh, yes, I know I was a strange bird. I did not go into sciences because at the end of the day, I was exposed to some of the most brilliant minds when we went on these expeditions and some of the most extreme places to learn about the most fascinating unknown things. And so I wanted to tie that with an understanding of what um, other people do in the world, uh, you know, businessmen and accountants and people who run the grocery stores and people in restaurants and to really be able to connect those two worlds so that we can have a better understanding, a better language, a better dialogue amongst each other to uh, talk about the value of ocean exploration and the value of our unique oasis in space. I've always been passionate about our ocean world. I've always been um, one that wanted to share with uh, the many out there who might never get a chance to go explore on their own in a virtual way this amazing place. And with that, one of the ways that we've done that, of course, as a family, is through the medium of television. For over 50, now 60 years, our family has shared on PBS, on TBS, uh, on ABC, on CBS, and Nat Geo and other platforms, uh, uh, Discovery Channel, and so on and so forth. Those uh, audio visual uh, adventures so that all of us can be on that adventure together, at least for a brief amount of time. But I dove into my past growing up as a kid. And for many of you out there who may be in the four to 12 year old category or a kid at heart, one of the things that um, I've always wanted to do is live out some of the early adventures that I read about when I was growing up. I always loved illustrated books. Illustrated books are like uh, cartoon books. And that really was something that shepherded me into learning more about what's out there, what's beyond my door, uh, and, and really had me dream as a child. One of those was Tintin. And uh, you can see from my t-shirt, I have a Tintin t-shirt. But Tintin uh, was a, a, a young reporter, and he brought his dog on many adventures around the world and into outer space to learn more about all these things. And really, it, it stimulated my curiosity. And I love that vehicle, the vehicle of a book. And I love social media. I love my phone. I love my iPad and all that. Um, and I love communicating with you on social media as well. But at the end of the day, there's no substitute for kind of tuning all that stuff out and digging into a book and really getting into that adventure. And so I thought to myself, well, you know, I've had a lot of real life adventures and I hope to continue many more uh, expeditions down the road. But I also wanted to be able to offer that platform to others who may really dig haha, <laughs> or enjoy um, reading about these adventures on book form. And so uh, a few years ago, I got a chance to partner up with uh, James Frajoli, who's our author, and Joe St. Pierre, who is our illustrator, to sculpt and write 
some illustrated books called Fabian Cousteau Expeditions to share with you in illustrated form some of our real life expeditions. Now these expeditions have been modified and a bit fictionalized so that it really transports you in an illustrated format into these wild adventures. There you go, here's a perfect example. And yes, for the first time, I'm a cartoon character. How awesome is that? Um, but uh, these guys right here, James and Joe, uh, are, were instrumental in being able to create these characters. Joe's done a lot of work with Marvel and DC Comics and many others. And James is a, 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 an amazing uh, writer who's published dozens of books out there. And so I can't thank them enough for making this become reality. The Great White Shark Adventure is the first in a series uh, that is being published by Simon & Schuster. Uh, this particular one is a propos with the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, uh, and I highly encourage you to dive into uh, this book. As a matter of fact, I think there will be a short video uh, published on uh, their site uh, to be able to at least give you a glimpse into these books. The new one that's coming out this month is called, uh, this is the second one in the series, this is called Journey Under the Arctic, where we go looking for the Dumbo octopus. And throughout these adventures, there's a lot of science integrated in a really fun, palatable way that kind of sneaks it in through the back door all while you're invited on this adventure with us. Now, with that, I'd like to open it up a little bit to questions because I'd love to hear from you and hopefully I can answer some of your questions while we dive into these uh, amazing adventures. So I'm going to look right here on our live. Here we go. What kind of inventions have you and your family created to help you explore? How did you have enough oxygen to be underwater for 31 days? What is your favorite shark? Those are many questions already, so let's start with the first one. What kind of inventions have you and your family created to help explore? Well, if you take yourself back to 1943, during the thick of World War II, Scuba diving hadn't been invented, and the only people that had really taken a peek underneath that blue veneer into the ocean world were uh, military divers who were using something called a rebreather, and it was usually a 100% oxygen rebreather, which is a very dangerous and limited uh, piece of uh, kit that only military were using back then. And number two, sponge divers with hard hats or those funny looking bell helmets with the lead boots that you see in old movies. And that's really uh, the, the majority of those who would actually know uh, much about the undersea world. My grandfather in 1943, along with an engineer from Air Liquide, uh, a gentleman by the name of Emile Gagnon, uh, co-invented the Aqualung the thing that you put in your mouth as a scuba diver, which is called a regulator. And with that, we're able to now break free of the bonds of gravity and that tube that connects you to, the, uh, to this topside world to go and scuba dive in the various parts of our ocean world. So that was one of the inventions. Later on, he invented, of course, the underwater camera housing. We now can take GoPros and, and red cameras and all sorts of other technology down to go to the scuba diving depths and beyond to go and film those things. But back then, none of that existed. So he built the first underwater camera housings, including uh, partnering with Nikon to build the Nikonos One, which was the first underwater still camera to take pictures, and the first underwater houses. And that leads into the question number two. One of you has obviously been following me because, at least one, <laughs> because you asked about living underwater for 31 days. Well, that plays into a mission I had a few years ago called Mission 31, where I took five other intrepid uh, burgeoning aquanauts and we lived, all six of us, underwater in the world's only remaining undersea marine laboratory called Aquarius. Now, Aquarius is like a house underwater with a small laboratory and everything that you need, just like in a house. You have the toilet, you have the galley or the kitchen, and you have your sleeping quarters or your bedroom. 
Now, it's a little bit cozy because as some of you who live in New York City or other uh, urban environments know, uh, it's like living in a studio apartment with five of your best friends. Aquarius's internal square footage was about 550 square feet, so it's pretty tight. A little bit more like a submarine, except a submarine has a hole on the one side, and you can go in and out of the water like a front door on your door on your on your house, but at the bottom. And so we were able to live for 31 days based out of that underwater habitat because the inside was full of air. Now that air was at the same pressure as the outside water pressure so that water wouldn't come rushing in. And that's what is called saturation diving. Saturation diving is uh, a way of breathing much thicker, heavier air where your body acclimates to those pressures very easily, as a matter of fact, or fairly easily anyway, and you are able to now go out into the water column for sometimes indefinite periods of time, meaning as long as you want to go and study and film things that you need to film. And that's the beauty and magic of an underwater laboratory. As opposed to going up from the surface down below to say 60 feet or three atmospheres, here we're already at the bottom of the sea and all we have to do is walk down those steps from our front door with our scuba gear and go out into that water column. And what that allows us to do is dive 8, 10, 12 hours a day, each of us, in those depths, as opposed to coming down from the surface where you have to go back up to the surface fairly quickly, an hour or less, depending on your air supply and your decompression obligations. It was really neat. Um, we had plenty of oxygen down there, which is part of the mix that we were breathing, which is just a regular air mix but at three atmospheres. And how we would do that is we would generate our air through uh, an air generator, which was based at the surface with an umbilical cord that would pump that air down to us constantly. Additionally, inside we had something called um, a scrubbing mechanism, a little bit like a rebreather that would take the CO2 that we exhale as human beings and replace that with a little bit more oxygen. And so that's basically how we would breathe underwater. Now we have another question that just popped. Oh, I'm sorry. What is your favorite shark? Ha ha. Very, very good question and a really complicated one for me to answer. I haven't seen all 470 plus species of shark out there. As a matter of fact, every time I, I encounter a shark in the wild, it's always a magical time especially nowadays when unfortunately they're being uh, fished out and there are very, very few of them out there. So we need to protect sharks. I don't need to tell you that, I don't think. But one of my favorites is probably the wobble gong. It's just a weird looking shark. It's pretty cool. And I love the name. Uh, there are a lot of other ones out there. The cookie cutter shark, the mako. Man, that thing is so fast. The tiger shark, which I think a lot of you probably know about. And of course, the great white shark, which is the largest uh, fish eater out there. But I also love the big ones, the basking shark, and of course, the whale shark. Pretty awesome looking animals. And guess what? They don't even eat anything like meat or fish. They eat these little things called phytoplankton or zooplankton, which they filter out with their gill rakers. They don't even have teeth of any note. They're more like uh, um, raspers, right? Uh, and, and that's something that, that we really need to kind of wrap our heads around because at the end of the day, sharks aren't out to get us whether we're on land or in the ocean. I love fiction, but let's really be careful about vilifying those poor animals that deserve to live in our aquatic ecosystem because they've been there for over 400 million years. We are the aliens in that environment. Okay, how can one become an aquanaut? Really good question. Um, you know, you have to think to yourself, why do you wanna become an aquanaut? Because just like becoming an astronaut, there's a lot of training involved and it's very complicated and sometimes very risky. So first you have to have a need and a curiosity, which I'm sure many of you have since you've tuned into this. 
I would say that uh, first you, you need to become a scuba diver. So once you become a scuba diver and maybe you have training in something like marine biology, engineering, biochemistry, or one of the many other disciplines that could benefit from ocean-based research, you can then become and train to become an aquanaut. And it's not really complicated, but physiologically and emotionally, you have to also become prepared. Because just like living out of the International Space Station in space, you're going to be living as uh, an aquanaut in the inner space station at the bottom of the sea. Once you're there, once you commit yourself to the project, to the mission, you have to stay there for the entirety of the mission. Swimming back to the surface is not an option unless you go through extensive decompression. And so that's how essentially you become an aquanaut. And there are very few places you can do that. You can go to a commercial diving, dive training uh, place. Uh, there are many of them out there. Uh, or you can go the other route, the scientific route, and go to a university, maybe become a professor, maybe become a professional biochem uh, engineer or scientist in a laboratory uh, someplace uh, in the world, be it the United States or other. And from there, you need to uh, train as an aquanaut. It sounds easy. It's not, but it's well worth it if that's something you really want to do. What was your favorite dive or expedition? Ha! You know, I have an answer to that. And that's usually pretty much the same answer that, that people, when they ask me, what's your favorite place to go? I always say the next one because I'm ever curious. I always want to know what's on the other side of that coral reef, what's on the other end of the blue veneer. And there's so many places left for me to explore. I don't really have a good answer for you on that. Although I will say that some of my favorite places are places like Papua New Guinea, the Arctic, up the Amazon River, which, by the way, is the subject to book number three, which will be coming out next year. What device do you have? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> need to start reading a little bit more, obviously. What advice do you have for youth who want to become an ocean explorer? Well, most people can become ocean explorers, even if it's just a hobby. Learn to snorkel. Get in the water. Start looking around with a mask and snorkel. There's so much out there. I've got to tell you that one of my favorite things to do, whether I'm working or whether I'm out there with my family, my eight-year-old and my wife, uh, or my extended family, just going to a beach, going to a river, going to a lake, putting on my mask and snorkel and going in the water and just looking at one square meter of underwater world is like looking at uh, a soap opera on television or on YouTube. It's amazing what you can see if you just sit there and observe. And so uh, there are a lot of things out there uh, that are left to discover. And for all of you out there, uh, it is just a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, if you want to become an ocean explorer, you have to have a reason, right? Uh, how do you make a living, first of all? And that's kind of important because an ocean explorer is a title, but it really has behind it a lot of complexities. Let me share with you uh, what usually happens in my daily life. I sit in places like this, my office, where I spend a lot of time making phone calls, uh, in uh, in <laughs> previous to coronavirus, uh, I would go and have a lot of meetings, and I would need to ask for uh, funding to be able to put together expeditions to go to places where we stand to discover something new. Along with that, I would invite some of my team members or other people to join the expedition to go out there and study the places that we go. And with that, we film the entirety of the thing and bring it back and bring uh, or put together uh, videos, whether they be uh, small vignettes online or whether they be, be full-blown documentaries on television or even sometimes on the big screen, such as Oceans 3D, to be able to share with the rest of the world. And that is a very long-winded way of saying that most of my job 
is handling baggage and begging for money. Uh, the fun stuff that you see on TV, the fun stuff that you see online is really like a small percentage of what we do. When we sit there in the field getting eaten up by bugs or being chased by anaconda or other things that, uh, that we really usually don't show on television. But that said, if you want to become an ocean explorer, we can stand to use a lot more of you out there, even if it's just snorkeling around in your bathtub or going out there as a scuba diver and bringing back some of those amazing stories to share with the world. How can everyone who is watching help ocean conservation? Now that's a really, really good question. Thank you so much for asking. One of the fundamental things that I try and integrate every time I go off on expedition or every time I uh, storytell is to try and connect people with the importance of our little oasis in space and our life support system. Ocean conservation is something uh, that is now becoming more and more popular, but for many, many years, we've neglected our ocean as an endless resource and a garbage can. And now we're seeing the big problems that are coming up, washing quite literally up on our shores. So some of the best things that we can do as individuals, whether we become ocean explorers or whether we are just regular people that go through our daily lives we need to understand that every decision that we make in our daily lives has a very fundamental impact on our life support system and our ocean. So if we can eliminate plastics, especially single-use plastics in our everyday lives, even just one a day is going to make a huge positive impact. We have over 300 million tons of garbage that goes and mostly plastic garbage that goes into our oceans every single year. We have um, pollution, including climate change related pollution, the, the gases that we as, as human beings put off into our atmosphere that get absorbed into our ocean, such as CO2, which then through chemical uh, change becomes carbonic acid in our ocean and attacks uh, coral reefs and our small uh, zooplankton, so the babies that are trying to grow shells uh, in our ocean. Uh, and these things are, are, are of paramount importance because it changes our weather patterns on land, it changes our food systems that we depend on to, uh, to feed ourselves, and of course all of our sentient beings on this planet. So we need to follow better guidelines, including taking up uh, an app such as the Seafood Watch Guide to make better decisions in the supermarket or the restaurant, uh, or nowadays when you're ordering to, for pickup. Uh, we need to also be very careful and vigilant about living with the planet rather than on the planet. And uh, with that said, we have so much uh, that we can do uh, as human beings to give back to our ocean world. It's a very important thing to make better decisions in our daily lives. You know, at home, in our communities, of course, in our government, and in our businesses. Because we need to give back to our future generations, you guys, what we as adults have taken for granted. I would love to show my eight-year-old places that, as uh, I was her age, I would wonder with. And uh, there are some places that I cannot bring, unfortunately, Dylan, or my nephew, Felix, who is also eight years old, that I wondered at as a child as they're at their age. But there are a lot of places out there that we can still protect. And those places should become marine protected areas if they aren't already. And as individuals, as human beings, each and every one of us has a role to play to make sure that those places become hope spots and sanctuaries so that we can start record, uh, restoring our aquatic water bodies. And you are the heroes that will help us do that. I've seen miracles where young people take up that challenge and change things. Ryan, who's online, uh, has been able to champion uh, plastic pollution by creating recycling programs in his hometown, 
by showing that we need to cut down on our consumption of single-use plastics. We need to stop using our ocean as an endless resource and a garbage can. And for the sake of all sharks out there in the world, let's stop hating them. Let's start respecting them and let's protect all those species out there that deserve our protection. Because if we want to be able to enjoy what this beautiful, unique oasis in space affords us, including every other breath that we take that's generated by our ocean world, then we need to treat it as if our lives depended on it, because it does. And with that, I want to thank you all so very much. And I want to share one thing that my grandfather used to say when I was a young man. People protect what they love. They love what they understand, and they understand what they're taught. Through education and through experiential learning, and by taking up your own adventure in your own world, we can learn a lot about our sentient beings, about our planet, about living together, and about creating a better world for our future, living in symbiotic relationship. And with that, I thank you all for sharing some of your time. I hope you get to enjoy some of these books. And please follow the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, the Ocean Learning Center, and do your part. I thank you all, and I look forward to seeing you at the bottom of the sea.